Hi, everybody. Could we just have your attention for five minutes or so, if you turn your attention up here to the stage? Um, no need to sit down or anything. We're just going to do a brief introduction to the day uh, and um, give you some sort of uh, some logistics for the next uh, 45 minutes or so. Uh, welcome to our first uh, Varsity Con event uh, to connect uh, student athletes with alumni, uh, alumni athletes. Uh, thanks so much for being here, waking up on a Sunday to, to come out for this event. I know there's a lot going on this weekend. It was Hall of Fame weekend this weekend, tons of games on campus. Uh, I know there's a game that's going to be going on, uh, the women's soccer game shortly, so I appreciate you all being here uh, for this event to start thinking about uh, maybe a career planning, thinking about what's going to come next uh, after you leave Brown. Uh, we're really excited about this event. This event has truly been a joint partnership between Career Lab uh, and uh, uh, the athletics department. Uh, we couldn't have done this event without the support of, uh, of Jack Hayes and Carolyn and, and Victoria and Jean and others in the department who've really uh, been pushing this forward, so we want to thank them. Uh, we also have a couple students who I know Carolyn's going to thank who've really been instrumental in putting this together for us from the Career Lab side. Uh, so we'll, we'll point them out in just a moment. Uh, I want to thank all the alumni who are here today and have, have given up some time on a Sunday to come out and talk with you about their career paths, about their experience. Um, thank you so much for being here. You're going to uh, meet some great alumni during the day today as well as hear from some great speakers uh, when we get to our, our keynote section of the day. Uh, and this event is really for, for you as students to start thinking about, you know, what, what does this idea of career mean? Career Lab really wants to work with you. So if you've never been into Career Lab, please make it a point to come see us. We're at 167 Angel over on Thayer Street. Uh, really important to start thinking about uh, your, your career planning as early as possible. Not because you need to choose something early on during your time at Brown, but because we want you to have lots of opportunities to explore to get internships, to get work experience, to network with alumni like this, um, to start getting your skills up to speed, you know, in terms of how you write a resume, how you interview, how you, um, how you can network with people. So it's really important to start thinking about this stuff now. And I think one thing that I want all of you to take away from today is that you have some unique advantages as student athletes uh, in the job search uh, process that we want you to be taking advantage of. You have lots of skills as a student athlete that employers, graduate schools really value. And, I, and I'm not just saying that because we hear it from employers who come through our office every day. They love to recruit student athletes. And if you're wondering what those skills are, come talk to me, come talk to some of my staff, come see us in Career Lab. You may know some of the skills already and we can sort of help you articulate those skills when you're in an interview setting or talking with an employer or with an alum. Um, today, I'm going to stop talking there because I could talk for a long time. Um, today, uh, we're going to start off with sort of our luncheon speed networking, and I know some of you have already gotten food. That's great. Continue to get food. Eat all of the food that's here today. Um, you're going to have an opportunity to grab lunch and then uh, join some of our alumni at these round tables that are set up to sort of have networking conversations to ask them about their career path, ask them how they navigated the career search process as a student athlete, which can be challenging given that you have a lot of demands on your time. Ask them how they dealt with that when they were students here. And please rotate around to all the tables. Even if it's maybe someone that isn't necessarily doing something that you think you might want to do, talk to alumni that are maybe doing things outside of your interest area, because that can be eye-opening and might, might open up some possible pathways for you as you're thinking about what you might do for an internship or what you might do for a job after Brown. Uh, then after our 45-minute uh, sort of luncheon networking session, we're going to ask you all to come sit in the audience and then uh, hear from our keynote speakers today, uh, and they are going to be fantastic. And then after that, we will break out into our breakout sessions, which are going to be across the green here in uh, Smith Bonanno. Uh, Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to turn it over to Carolyn and also give my thanks to Carolyn, who's been really involved in the planning of this event. Uh, but Carolyn, please take it away. Thank you. I don't know if I need a mic being a former coach, but I'll, I'll take it. I wanted to thank Matt in the Career Lab. He didn't announce who he was. He's actually the director of the Career Lab. Also to Amy Tarbox and, uh, Tarbox and Karen Wittett, if you guys could just put your hand up. They did a lot of work from that office. And could I have the two students up, Ben Bosis and uh, Austin Reynolds, just to come up on stage so students can see you. Uh, they were instrumental, did a lot of work. They were here this summer, um, and they did all the things behind the scenes. So I just wanted them to come up and be seen 
Every single student athlete should thank both of them, and I thank you guys really much. Really, really appreciate it. And they're both athletes, and they're both athletes too. We have uh, track and field in our men's crew team, but thank you to both of them. Um, for the alumni that are here, thank you very much for coming back. I was fortunate enough to be at our Hall of Fame dinner last night, and we had over 450 people um, recognized, uh, recognizing our former student athletes. So hopefully, and we also had President Pax in there, which is a huge statement. I've been through six or seven presidents since I've been here at Brown. I've been here for 35 years, so to have her acknowledge what we do on a daily basis, and a lot of that is a credit to our athletic director, Jack Hayes, who's been very supportive and worked with the president to help educate her on what, what we do. Uh, the alumni that are here have actually represent 17 concentrations, 14 different sports, 12 different industries. We have four uh, alumni that are here that are on our Athletic Advisory Council. We have four current Brown employees. Two of them are actually in the athletic department. So we have a wealth of knowledge and experience here. So enjoy the day, and if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask Matt or myself. Thank you. All right, thank you. I, I'm so pleased to see that there are a lot of great conversations happening. Uh, all, your alumni, also, you don't have to stand at your tables. You're welcome to join us here in the seating area. Um, glad to see so many great conversations. Hopefully, these conversations can continue out throughout the rest of the uh, afternoon. Uh, but right now, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Carolyn again to introduce our first of uh, two keynote speakers uh, this afternoon. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to be able to introduce both of our keynote speakers today, both who I uh, had the opportunity to see them compete here as student athletes in the sport of uh, lacrosse. And our, so I'll, without further ado, I'll get to our first keynote speaker, Paris Waterman Dupree. I know her as Hollywood. Uh, I, I think I have nicknames for everyone. Uh, Brown class of 11 and currently is a lawyer with uh, Pepper Hamilton in Philadelphia. Uh, while at Brown, all Ivy, f two or three times, US team player, academic, all Ivy, uh, more or less wrote the book on the field and off the field. And with that, we are very proud to welcome her back to Brown. Good afternoon to all of you. Um, I was glad that we had the opportunity the last 45 minutes or so just to get to talk to you guys, hear where you are in your journeys. Um, it's really exciting. Any chance that I get to come back to campus is awesome for me. Uh, Brown holds a special place in my heart. Um, so I'm glad to be back here today and really happy to be back here meeting with um, some of the current student athletes. Um, you all have decided to spend your Sunday afternoon thinking about your futures, being proactive about your futures, and taking advantage of a pretty cool opportunity, which is the opportunity to meet and learn from some former Brown athletes who were in your shoes, some of them not too long ago. So I thought it might be beneficial to you to talk to you a little bit today and share a few thoughts on leveraging your athletic experience as you make the transition into the professional world. And I thought I might do that by focusing on some of the things that I personally think helped me, as well as things that I wish I had known when I was in your shoes. How does that sound? Pretty good? Okay, cool. Um, if at the end of this I've done one thing correctly, I've, if you've learned one thing from me, I think that I've done okay. So let's get started. As athletes, we were taught to prepare for success. We devote hours, days, months, and years to our craft. But those years can fly by before we know it, and they will for all of you. When our time competing comes to an end, and it will for each one of you, we suddenly face a lot of questions about what the future holds and changes. What will our days look like when our lives aren't structured around class, practices, competition? We'll all have to figure that out at some point. And once you guys pass through the Van Wickle gates, I'm confident that each of you will do great things with your lives. But those great things will and, and can take a lot of work. So the sooner that you begin thinking about what your life after Brown will look like, the better. That's not to say that you need to have it all figured out. 
Actually, that's quite the contrary. It's not the case at all, and it was not the case for me. I'm several years removed from my undergrad days. I've completed law school, and I've been a practicing attorney for several years, but I'm still figuring it out. What I mean is that the sooner that you guys begin to prepare yourself for life after, after Brown, the more equipped you'll be to take on post-Brown life. And you all being here today is a great start at doing just that. The first thing I want you guys to keep in mind is that it's a journey. For some of you, you may have known what you wanted to do since you were young, and that's great, but for many others, you're still figuring it out. And Brown, your time here at Brown is going to be instrumental in helping you get a little bit closer to figuring out what you want to do with your life. And I shared this story with many of you just a few moments ago, but when I stepped foot on College Hill 10 years ago, oh geez, didn't seem like it's been that long, but 10 years ago, as a freshman, I was convinced that I wanted to be pre-med. I just knew it, I wanted to be pre-med, I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon, I wanted to work with athletes as a doctor, right? I just knew it. But after a couple of semesters of the heavy math and science curriculum, particularly Orgo, I learned that that was not my calling. <laughs> I think I was in love with the idea of being a doctor and being able to work with athletes and really hadn't spent much, other, much time thinking about other ways that I could still be involved in athletics. I didn't have a, enough of a passion to make a career out of it. And four years at Brown, four years in med school, residency, it, it, doing, doing something that you don't enjoy for that long just wasn't going to be beneficial to me. So I had to go back to the drawing board. During my sophomore year, I developed an interest in marketing, and during the summer, I actually had the opportunity to work in Cartoon Network's consumer marketing group, which was awesome. Um, I was down in Atlanta, and I had the chance to uh, really be on the forefront of a lot of the marketing materials that if you grew up on Cartoon Network or TBS or Turner that you probably have seen firsthand, and it was great. Um, I learned that I really liked the business side of working um, at Cartoon Network, and the creative side, not as much. So once I was back at Brown for my junior year, I spent time really trying to think about careers that might interest me. Although there were various aspects of the business world that I loved, I knew that I wasn't ready and didn't want to exclusively focus on uh, finance opportunities with big banks like a lot of my classmates at Brown had decided to do. I just wasn't ready to focus on that. It wasn't, as, I didn't want to, uh, I wanted some balance in my career and I knew that early on. So the following summer, I did end up uh, in New York working at a financial institution, but in the HR department. So I was able to um, really get to see another side of what it's like to maybe work in a corporate environment that necessarily wasn't just being um, an investment analyst or something that I, you know, many of our classmates had, had done or decided to do. So I was offered employment following that summer, but I actually declined it. Uh, because it just didn't feel right. And at that point, I had decided that I, I think I wanted to continue um, schooling. And that's when law school came into the picture. I had always been intrigued about the intersection of business and law, and so it was a great option for me because it provided me with some balance and flexibility that I always found myself seeking. So the fall of my senior year, I began studying for the LSAT, and <laughs> that was a challenge. Managing academics, athletics, studying for the LSAT, which is one of the most challenging exams that you know, I would ever take in my life, was just a little bit too much. I just couldn't put my best foot forward in any one of those areas trying to manage it all. Not to mention that it was senior year, and honestly, I just wanted to enjoy my senior year at Brown. So I ended up deciding to push the LSAT to the next year and was okay with being a little bit more undecided than some of my classmates when I was graduating, which was honestly the best decision that I made. I moved back after graduation to my home state of Delaware and actually worked at a private school, a K through 12 school, 
in the alumni relations department. So I did annual fun, um, and it was really, really, it was really, really fun. I also got a chance to coach high school girls basketball and lacrosse, and so this had nothing to do with what I uh, honestly do now, so practicing the law. But it gave me a nice break from the rigors of being in the classroom, and it also gave me time to really figure out that law school is actually, in fact, what I wanted to do. Because getting into something that you're not sure about, um, investing in a legal degree in education is something that should not be taken lightly. So if you need extra time, I would really encourage you to really take advantage of that when you're graduating and you're fresh out of school and don't feel like you have to have it figured out just because maybe your classmates are taking that step right away. Take all the time you need to because work will always be there. When I started, so I took a year off um, to work at this school, but when I started law school a year later at the George Washington University Law School, I wasn't quite sure even then what I wanted to focus on specifically. Sports law had always sounded interesting to me, and it is, and I had the pleasure of speaking to some of the guys on the men's basketball team about that, but I also found and developed other interests while I was there. I again was fortunate to have two intern summer internships while I was in law school, that allowed me the opportunity to see various aspects. I got to take a, take a look into the litigation world, which involves heavy research, legal writing, and I really just didn't jive <laughs> with that too well. But I also had the chance to work on the business and the corporate transactional side. So I got to work with startup companies, uh, venture capitalists, funds, um, and work with them on their deals, their transactions, and become a part of their business team. And I loved that. It was interesting to me. I liked being able to work on multiple projects at once rather than focusing on a discrete legal question for months and years. And for some people, that's what they prefer to do and props to you, but that was just not what, um, what I was passionate about. So my story is just one of many, and I hope you have the chance today to hear from a lot of the alums um, and I just wanted to share it to emphasize my first point, that it is a journey. And I by no means have mastered this journey, but I've been able to do a lot of different things to help me figure out what I'm passionate about, touch a lot of different people, um, and really just continue to move myself um, in a direction that I feel like I'll be proud of what I've done when it's all said and done. The other thing I want to remind you guys is to recognize that success isn't going to happen overnight. Great things take time to develop. I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago and Serena Williams was speaking and she was talking about her journey and her rise to success both in the tennis arena and, um, and in the business world. And she said one simple thing that stuck with me and it's very, very simple. She said, there's no way around hard work. It's simple. I think we all know that as student athletes that there is no way around hard work. But I mention this because the same way that you all have put so much energy, effort, hard work, and dedication into your sports, finding and establishing a career also takes that same work. You really have to work your butt off. And creating anything worthwhile is going to take dedication. It's going to take persistence. It's going to take being able to deal with adversity and obstacles. Those same things that you experience on the court, on the field, in a pool, are the same things that you may encounter as you figure out and navigate your career. The other thing I wanted to touch on, and you guys are already doing it here, is networking is important, and you really need to cultivate relationships. And I think that was one thing I, that I underestimated when I was in your shoes, was the power of a network. I can't tell you the number of times in my short career that I've been able to rely on my network. Many times when I've been in job interviews, the first thing that they like to talk about is my experience at Brown. And that's typically because there's someone within their organization who went to Brown and spoke so highly of it, or they've had success with Brown graduates just generally. The value of a face-to-face -face connection is more important than ever these days. So ask people to coffee, Go to more events, talk to people in real life, don't just rely on email to communicate. It's how you'll get noticed, it's how you'll learn, it's how you'll get hired, it's how you'll get ahead. 
and find a good mentor or mentors to support you and act as an unbiased sounding board. And as I mentioned, you guys already have networks. The broader Brown community, which includes your professors, classmates, the athletic community, which includes your coaches, fellow student athletes, teammates, the athletics administration. Start developing and cultivating these relationships now. You will do yourself a disservice if you don't. Many of the experiences that I've shared have stemmed from a Brown relationship. I'm currently working at a firm where a partner that I work with most of the time is a Brown grad. He was a former Brown athlete and was on the men's lacrosse team. At my last firm, a partner that I also worked with was a Brown grad. He was a former Brown athlete from the men's soccer team. So it's not limited to your experience here. As soon as you guys leave, these, this, leave this campus and enter into the professional world, you'll start to see that there is a, a great expansive Brown network and you should start to take advantage of that. You'll find that Brown alumni are eager to help current students and other alumni, as evident by the folks that are here in this room today. And one other thing I want to note is that I don't want you to make the mistake of exclusively focusing on relationships in a hierarchical sense. And what I mean by that is focusing only on relationships with people who you perceive to be in positions of power or influential. No doubt, those are great relationships to have and I encourage you to develop those as well. But you should also, while you're here, focus on cultivating relationships with your peers, both in and outside of the athletic arena. Many of my classmates and many of yours have or will go on to do some really cool things, work in interesting spaces, and really excel in their careers. Both you and your classmates will someday be those people in positions of power or influence. And it may be hard to see that, but don't make the mistake of being short-sighted. The last point I want to make and encourage you to do is to take advantage of all the opportunities that you're presented with. In case you don't know or need to be reminded, Brown is a great place. And being a student athlete at this university is one of the best experiences that you'll have here. Every day there's something interesting that's going on on this campus. Be open-minded, keep perspective, try something new. You never know where your opportunities might lead you, the places they may take you, or the impact of the people that you meet along the way may have on you. And remember that opportunity doesn't come, only comes to those who create it. So be active, get involved. Think about what excites you, what really gets you going. Explore, talk to people, do your homework, pick their brains, figure out what your strengths and weaknesses are, and do some soul searching. And when you think you've got it all figured out, just go at it with all you've got. Thanks. Thank you, Paris. Our next uh, keynote speaker is a local alum, Bernie Bonanno, class of 88, uh, former men's lacrosse player, all Ivy in the Brown Athletic uh, Hall of Fame, actually ran the entire Hall of Fame last night. With further ado, I'd like to welcome Bernie. Thanks, Care. Okay, Paris, nice job. Tom Dwyer, right? I love Tom. Tom is a former teammate. It sounds like you work with him down at Pepper, yeah. So Tom was class of 90, I think. So Tom, I said hi. Um, so anyhow, uh, thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Bernie Bonanno. Uh, as Carolyn said, class of 88. Um, it's actually an honor to be here. I appreciate Carolyn and Jack and the administration's confidence. I'm not going to completely screw this up, so I'll try not to embarrass you. Um, I'll try to move this along. As Paris was speaking, I was slashing all sorts of stuff I was going to say, not because she had stuff I was going to say, just because I realized I was off base. Um, but I'm going to tell you just a few things briefly. One is um, my story, a little bit about my story, what, what made Brown special for me. Uh, then I want to talk a little bit about some advice uh, that I'd like to share with you guys that is advice uh, that is not my own, but was from one of my real great mentors in life. And then finally talk a little bit about career advice, as, as Paris did. My story at Brown, as Carolyn said, is I'm a local guy. I walked across the street to go to Brown. I played lacrosse. I went to class. I graduated. Um, and that can become a pretty dull story 
pretty quickly. But when you think about your own story and where you came from, I think what really makes Brown special is the relationships you develop here. And you hear a lot about that. We heard about a lot about that last night as well. Um, but in version one of my story, you know, I played lacrosse, I did this, I did that. That's really not the story. The story is I was a very incomplete person when I got here to Brown, and I still am. It's a constant process to um, improve yourself and learn from others. And what I got most out of Brown, uh, I wouldn't just say it was the relationships, it's what I learned from those people. So a few, a few examples. Uh, my guy John Kia right here. Stand up, John. John, no, he can't stand up. He's got a bad knee. Uh, he tore his ACL falling off a, 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 like a monkey bar or something. Uh, that's, you get fragile when you get older, guys, so enjoy your youth. Um, in any event, John Keogh was the captain of the team when I was a sophomore. And um, we talked a lot about leadership. Our coach, Dom Stargia, um, taught us a lot of life lessons. John and I would agree um, how much... Dom had an impact on both our lives, but, but John, and I'm not trying to embarrass, but John was a great leader. Um, he taught me about leadership, he taught me about being tough, he talked to me about taking responsibility, he talked me about getting in someone's face, and he, talked about earn, he taught me about earning the respect of his peers. So when I got to Brown, yeah, I have a relationship with John, but, but what I'm thinking about is what, what did I learn from some of these relationships that I developed, and that's genuine. I learned a lot from John, and we got a relationship 30, 30 years later. Another guy, Walt Cataldo, I worked with. Uh, Walt was Bill Rick Amass, tough as nails, football across. I learned grit from Walter. So when I think about what I've done in my life, and I think about the importance of leadership or grit, I have people that brought those capabilities to Brown that I didn't have, and I'm still working on them every day. Another friend of mine, Greg Rogers, who, who John knows, um, he taught me about being authentic. Okay, so when I got to Brown, you're trying to impress people, and I don't know about you guys, but I wasn't even sure I belonged here. And so what I learned from Greg is the value of being authentic, being who you are. And I don't know about you guys, I really value that in a relationship or relationships that I have, and I've taken that with me through the rest of my life. And then finally, a guy named Sam Iserson. These are all familiar names to Johnny, and you would think, well, what I learned from Sam? Sam was, um, you know, a guy that grew up in Long Island. He came here to play soccer and lacrosse. A little short guy, loud, you know, like one of those guys. But what I learned from Sam uh, was to be completely genuine. Sam was a genuine, not full of crap guy. And when you get out into the real world, if you're full of crap or not genuine, it doesn't work that well. So, and, and I could go on and on. Um, so when I think about Brown, I don't think about what I learned in the classroom or even about playing. I think about all the personal relationships I had and what I take from them. So you guys are sitting in a room today, you got relationships all over campus. Paris mentioned how broad and diverse this place is. Take advantage of it, learn from your peers. It's the greatest thing you'll take from Brown. Second thing I want to share is a little bit of a life lesson. Dom Starge, who we talked about him for earlier, but Dom was our coach. He was larger than life. Um, we called Brown Lacrosse at the time, Brown State, we still do. We took, we took pride in our blue collar, work ethic, uh, non-pretentious approach to life and lacrosse. And, um, you know, Don taught us a lot, but one of the things he's done in his career since Brown is he's written a lot of letters, and he wrote a letter to his son that he wished he had written to his son when he went to college. So he wrote, his son graduated from college 10, 15 years later. Dom's seen 40 years of young athletes go through school, and he's seen the highs of national championships and really the depths of lows over the course of his career from young people making mistakes. And he wrote a letter to his son that he wished he had sent them, him. And, and I've sent that same letter to two of my kids who have gone off to college so far. And I wanted to share a couple things that came out of that letter that I think are worthwhile hearing. So he said, I read, Dear Joe, in the grand scheme of your life, I do not believe there will be a, large, a lot of other moments that have had as profound of an influence on your evolution as going away from home for the first time. It was he, American poet C.C. Cummings, who said, it takes courage to grow up and become who you really are. 
So this is a defining moment in your life, is what Don was saying to his son, and he wished he had written this before he went off to college. And then his first piece of advice in his letter is, smart guys don't learn from their own mistakes. They learn from the mistakes of others. Um, he then offered to give him names and numbers, his son names and numbers of countless former players who dug themselves in a hole they could not get out of. So trust me, you've been here for a couple years, it's not too late, it's great advice. Learn from mistakes of others, don't make them yourself. Second piece of advice that I really liked in his letter was uh, he, he advised to his son managing to a guiding principle of all things in moderation. I have a feeling he's talking about drinking, but it applies to most things in life. He said, learn to say enough even when surrounded by upperclassmen mayhem. I swear these same teammates will come to respect you for it in the daylight hours. Uh, those with a voice of reason become the true leaders on their teams. So great advice, not necessarily something that I always uh, adopted when I was at Brown. I wish I had, but I, I think it's great advice as a, as a parent. Third, that I'll read you and then I'll move on. And um, he said, most important, tell the truth, always. Don't compromise. Lying always requires more lying as a slippery slope. Take responsibility for your life and actions. If something goes astray, square up, he says, and face the music. It will always give you the best chance to move on. So, you know, these sound kind of obvious, but in the heat of the moment, moderation, telling the truth, these kind of things, they don't always happen. And so just thought I'd give you a, a little guidance from one of my great mentors in life. So finally, some career advice. Um, you know, this is the what do we look for and uh, how do we as a firm represent ourselves. Carolyn mentioned um, I'm in the private equity business, uh, so we're in the investment business. And the first thing I would tell you guys is that if you're on your Ivy League high horse, get off it. Um, it doesn't sell. You know, people know that you, if you're representing yourself, that you go to Brown. And if you're leading with that, you're already behind the eight ball. Um, the fact that you have an Ivy League education will get you in some doors, but it's, it's really not going to be what's going to be um, a, a secret to your success. So I would get off the high horse. We personally hate uh, when, especially not Brown really, but Princeton, Harvard, Yale, you know, these guys. We, I mean, they come in, they're so cocky, and they really don't know much. Um, so get off the high horse. It's no good. Um, when I was at Brown and then after Brown, I did a bunch of stuff. And I think some of the greatest experiences in my life were some of these jobs, but I actually swept the floor at the Ratty. <clears throat> so I had a job in the Ratty and I'd clean up after everyone and it was really crappy work, but I learned a lot from it. I learned humility. I was a security guard at what was sales hall at the time at night. Uh, I worked on a construction site in the summer. I was a bartender. And I even had a summer job downtown at the Attorney General's office where I was put in the dungy basement of the office and asked to clean out boxes of legal documents for six weeks. No windows, musky, everything. And, you know, you never forget that stuff. And so, you, know, you come back to Ivy League, you guys get all this incredible opportunity. You know, there, there's not a job that's really above you as a young person. You, you learn from everything. And um, you probably learn more from doing that than from some other stuff. After graduation, my first job, you know, was captain of the lacrosse team. I thought I had it going on. I was a Brown grad. I took a job at a law firm down in New York called Skadden Arps, a huge law firm. I was going to go to law school. Turned out I wasn't as smart as Paris, but I, I worked there for a year, and I basically photocopied for, literally for a year. I just was, like, running around doing, like, ridiculous, stupid jobs. Um, but it was humbling, and I had to work my ass off, and eventually I found a better opportunity. I went down and, and worked at a Wall Street firm, and there I got to work for like 20 hours a day. It was, um, but I, I really did work very, very hard. And when you get out of Brown, uh, you're back at the bottom of the totem pole. Um, you have to work hard, you have to be humble, and uh, you have to do whatever you have to do. Paris talked about relationships. I went, I went on to Harvard Business School after Wall Street. And uh, when I was there, uh, my summer job in between years came from a relationship I had from lacrosse. Uh, a guy named Tim Dibble was at a private equity firm, and he was kind of looking for a guy, got back to do this junky job stuff. He was looking for a guy to do kind of a really administrative job at his firm, and I really wanted to get into private equity. And I put my hand up, 
you know, we had a relationship through lacrosse. I said, I'll do whatever it takes. What is it? And he gave me the job, Trojan Horse Theory. I get inside the firm. I do that job well. And then, by the way, I ask him what he's working on over here. And I get to work on a couple transactions this summer. And it really was the catalyst for now what's been a 25-year career in private equity. So I took a relationship uh, through sports. Uh, I had some humility. Uh, I did a really dirty job, and then I turned that into a career. So it can happen, and it, and it happens more than you think. Um, <clears throat> you know, where we are today, we're, we've been very lucky. Uh, I ended up, after business school, joining a bank down here in Rhode Island. We then spun out of that bank and formed a private equity firm about 20 years ago, and we've been growing it ever since. We actually manage money for Brown and other big institutions. And when we talk about our culture to our investors or to our pr prospective employees, we talk about a few things. Um, am I going on too long, by the way? Anyone give me a nod? All right. So uh, the first thing we, that we talk about is table stakes. Um, if you kind of come work for us, the table stakes are you got to be smart. Okay, we, we don't want to hire dummies. Um, you got to be super hardworking. Okay, so if you're kind of lazy, you got a lot of this stuff going on, don't bother. Uh, you have to have perfect integrity. We can't compromise our institution and our firm for someone who's going to try and cut corners. So um, that's a big one. And then you have to be intellectually honest. Uh, do not come inside Nautic or really any great institution and BS. You know, to be very honest about what your strengths and weaknesses are. If you're doing work for someone, if you're reporting to John, you've got to tell it like it is. And if you tell it like it is, that's all someone can ask of you. So those are table stakes, uh, smart, hardworking, integrity, and intellectual honesty. Then what do we look for? I've said it now a few times, but, um, and this has really grown on me over my career, but the number one thing is humility. Uh, and the reason we say that is really for two reasons. One is I prefer humble people. Who wants to hang around with a bunch of arrogant people? Um, in some cultures, you know, arrogance plays. You got to kind of play that game. So, you know, if you end up at one of those places, maybe this is bad advice. But in our world, humility plays really well. Um, but aside from the personality aspect of humility, well, when we talk about investing someone's money, it it's actually results in better outcomes. And the reason is, if you're the smartest guy in the room where you think you are, you're probably not listening to everyone else in the room as well as you should. And so if I do anything well as an investor, I'm trying to learn from people that are way smarter than me, process that information, and then come to the right conclusion. There was someone in my business he, a number of years ago who said he used to call a guy who was the smartest guy he ever met. He was on the West Coast. Whenever he had a deal, he'd call him up. He'd say, hey, Bill, got this deal. Let me tell you about it. Tell him about it. And then he'd say, so what do you think I'd do? should do, should I do the deal or not? And Bill would say yes or no, and he'd hang the phone up, he'd do the opposite. Um, and it's true. So, so humility results in better outcomes because you're much more inclined to listen to smart people and not think you got all the answers. The other thing is teamwork. Uh, we look for team players. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a close cousin of humility, um, but it's about service leadership. So. We interview people a lot, and it's amazing how often people come in and talk about themselves and what they want out of their career and what they want out of this job and what promotion tracks look like. And so that's their orientation. And, and you know, we'll answer those questions. But what we really prefer is people, young people, who come in and understand what we're trying to accomplish as a firm, right? What is our business? What have we done well, not well? You can get a lot of information on the internet. And then come talk to us about your skills and how they match our firm and how you can help us be successful. Believe it or not, I mean, I still feel like I'm about 28. Um, and I've got my only da daily pressures. I'm trying to be successful. I haven't, you know, stopped trying to make this thing work. And so if any of you can help me be more successful, you got a job. I mean, that's the bottom line. So when you're interviewing and talking and even working at a place, your job is about service leadership, how can you help them be more successful? Give you a quick story, maybe this uh, will help you remember this concept. We had a company that was really troubled, over levered, earnings down, kind of a mess. We had to replace the entire management team and we brought in a guy that used to run a big business for us who was entirely different than our old CEO. 
Uh, old CEO was, you know, we'd have lunches on China and silver and everything was too much money and too fancy and Bob Norton came in and he was just a kind of down and dirty CEO but he could get the job done. And he got the whole group together who was, you know, it's a big company but this, the leadership who hadn't been terminated and he said, everything we've been doing here, scratch it. And he said, our whole organizational structure is an upside down triangle. So he drew up a triangle on the board and he said, the way our organization works is that's my job right here at the bottom of the triangle. And as we as a senior leadership uh, think about our positions within the organization, work your way up that up upside down triangle. And at the, at the very top of the upside down triangle are our customers. And then it's the employees touching the customers and then employees down below that. And our job is to service up within the organization. And it really was a complete diametrically opposed organizational structure to what we had previously. It went on to be a really successful investment. Bob was a huge hero for us, but I'll never forget the upside down triangle. A um, Couple other things. How do you talk about yourself? If you're on a team and uh, you've had some success, do you say I or we? At Nautic, we hate I. Don't say I, that's my advice. So anything I'm saying here, someone else might give you other advice, so you gotta come to your own conclusion, but my advice is get rid of the word I. Um, when we talk about things, we say, we did this deal, or we made this change, or we made this investment, or we sold this company, or we hired this person. Um, and I have primary responsibility for our firm right now, but I'll never say the word I, or if I do, I'm gonna be making a mistake. So just a little piece of advice. Uh, become an expert. If you can in your desired career, the world from what John and I got involved in 30 years ago has become infinitely more competitive. So to the extent you can become an expert in anything, uh, it goes back to service leadership and your ability to add value to an organization. And then finally, um, embrace failure. You hear a lot about this, um, but we're big believers in it. And um, I think I fail every day. If I, don't, if I haven't had a failure a day in some way or something bad's kind of knocked me back a little bit, it's probably not been a real day. And so when we talk to people about failure and we're interviewing people, if they haven't failed or they tell us eh, they don't have a good one, it's like, well, you're probably not living. Um, so no one wants to fail. Every, one, every day I wake up, I want to win 100% of the time, but I'm not gonna. And so uh, learn from your failures as athletes you're failing all the time, right? You're missing a shot, you're missing a putt, you're missing whatever you're doing. And embrace that and learn from it. Same thing applies to work. Uh, <clears throat> so, I've said enough, but I'm gonna come back to my, my former coach, Dom. And he wrote another letter and he said, uh, <clears throat> he said, if I were speaking to a group of young people, so I thought this applied, um, and we were forging a blueprint for the rest of their athletic lives, I would suggest the overriding goal would be to develop into exceptional leaders as judged by your peers. So I thought that was a really good way to think about leadership. Um, you guys could look at me and say, geez, he's a leader, not a leader after this talk, doesn't really matter. But you know who the leaders are amongst yourselves. So make it a goal to be judged as exceptional leaders by your peers. He said, the journey will lead to your other goals. And then he went on to say, to become a leader, you will need a streak of fearlessness. You'll have to have self-consideration for your team and teammates. So we've talked about service leadership and, and team work. You have to speak the truth to peers. So that's intellectual honesty. You have to be the hardest worker and you have to radiate self-discipline and be tough and engaged at all times. So this, in my opinion, is a recipe for success at Brown in life. Um, I would advise you to embrace the qualities of great leadership and leaders, and um, I wish you all the luck. That's all I got.